So my name is Jeff McCartney. I'm the Director of Research for the Institute of the Environment here at uh, the University of Ottawa and also for Sustainable Prosperity. Uh, this is our annual Fulbright Lecture and uh, we are very honoured and happy to have uh, Dr. Martin Heitzelman here this year. Um, just a little bit before I get started is we'd like to very much thank the, the um, Fulbright Canada for supporting us in offering this chair. Martin is our second chair uh, in environment economy here at the Institute of the Environment and uh, we hope to continue with this program. Uh, Martin himself is our visiting chair in environment and economy. Uh, he uh, comes from Clarkson University where he's an associate professor and the Frederick C. Mentz Scholar of Environmental Economics uh, as well as the director of the Clarkson University Centre for Canadian Studies. Uh, he holds an MA and a PhD in Economics and an MS in Natural Resource Policy and Behaviour from the University of Michigan and also a Bachelor of Science in Economics from Duke University. Uh, I can also attest that Martin upholds a very fine tradition of our Fulbright chairs being uh, big hockey fans and so uh, that, that's always welcome here too. So without further ado, I'll introduce Martin and just a note on procedure, I think Martin's going to talk for uh, about 60 minutes or so and then we have uh, two panellists who I'll introduce later and a discussion following that. So. Great, thank you Jeff. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's, you know, one of my, uh, I've been an environmental economist and sort of knew my career path for a long time and um, I also at Duke was an un one of my, I had an economics major, uh, but I also had a second major in Canadian studies for honestly no good reason at the time. Um, but so this is a great uh, mix, an uh, opportunity for me to bring all of that together um, in this Fulbright has been that, an opportunity for that. So it's been great to be spending so much time in Ottawa um, and now I get to talk about environmental economics, so that's great. Okay, so uh, the paper I'm talking about today is about the uh, property value impacts of a wind farm in, uh, on Wolf Island in a Thousand Island region. Uh, this work is joint with Richard Vine from the University of Guelph as well as Sarah Guth who was a summer uh, research uh, student from Middlebury College who came to Clarkson uh, last summer of 2014. So uh, we're, called, we're gonna do a hedonic analysis which is a property value analysis of the wind farm on Wolf Island. Uh, I'll show you a map of where that is if you're not familiar. Um, the interesting thing about this from an economic, well one of the interesting things about this from an economics perspective is that uh, it's on a border um, and so this gives us an opportunity to isolate uh, communities that are impacted only by the amenity aspect of the wind farm versus communities that also receive uh, benefits, uh, direct benefits, monetary benefits from the wind farm. So we're going to get the opportunity to isolate those effects. The, as I say, the benefits will accrue only in Canada. The costs are going to be shared on both sides of the border. Um, this gives us that opportunity to separate these impacts. And just as a little preview, we're going to find uh, significant negative impacts on the American side of the border and no significant impacts on the Canadian side of the border, which frankly was the exact opposite of what I expected when I started this work. Um, so. I think a lot of you are here because you're interested in wind energy. Uh, wind energy makes up an increasing share of our electricity portfolio. Um, to the extent that it's going to substitute away, help us substitute our electricity portfolio away from coal and natural gas and other fossil based sources, it's going to have good environmental benefits. Many of these benefits will accrue not locally but globally. Um, and so that uh, gives us a little bit of a uh, uh, the, the, something to think about in terms of uh, this conflict between local costs and global benefits. And wind farms, I think, tend to um, really uh, be a great example of that, right? Where local residents often oppose wind facilities, they don't like wind facilities, uh, but they have global benefits um, for the rest of us. Uh, it's projected to be the largest non-hydro-renewable in the U.S. It's projected capacity is expected to triple in Canada by 2035. Worldwide, it's supposed to more than double by 2040. Wind is growing. We all know China's uh, doing a lot of uh, work in wind, uh, wind development. Uh, Europe has, has done a lot of wind development, so there's more and more all the time. But, as with anything, uh, change is bad. 
Okay, frankly, uh, people don't like change. So uh, significant resistance, local uh, wind developments in many areas. Uh, people worry about the visual amenities. They worry about noise and health impacts. Property values are always a huge flashpoint, or often a huge flashpoint. Um, and this is just you know one of the things about uh, the local versus global thing is that you often have environmentalists on both sides of this fight too. So you'll have one side on one side you'll have environmentalists worried more about global issues promoting wind, and you'll have local environmentalists worried about bird kills, bat kills, um, all sorts of things more locally, including amenities. And so it's an interesting uh, an interesting conflict I think that in some ways is unique to wind. So let's dig in a little bit to what some of these disamenities look like. So here I have three different uh, wind farms, all from the sky. Um, I don't know how well you can see them. Hopefully you can see them all. So this is, uh, this, the top two are projects that I've previously studied in Franklin and Jefferson counties of New York. And this is the Wolf Island facility on the bottom. That's, uh, I think, a view from the eastern end of the island looking west. Um, one of the things I want to point out, well, actually, maybe I'll come back. I'll come back to this pic these pictures when I um, when I discuss these how local issues matter because you'll notice some differences in these pictures, or I'll point out some differences in these pictures that I think are important. Um, okay, now let's see if I can make this work. So there should be a, there we go, perfect. Okay, so one thing that people worry about is shadow flicker, and as most things on the internet, this is a particularly egregious example of shadow flicker, uh, but you can see how this would be annoying, right? You've got shadows moving across your whole yard, including uh, by your windows. No one's going to like that. People worry a lot about this. To be fair, like I said, though, I think this is a particularly poorly sighted wind turbine uh, that puts that shadow right on that poor girl's face as she sits there on the porch. Okay, so I can be done with the video. Okay, um, beyond the sort of visual amenities, uh, noise and health impacts have, have also been a concern. Although the newer turbines don't make very much noise, people do worry a lot about low frequencies. Um, so there's a great study by the Council of Canadian Academies uh, that came out last year, I think it was a Fulbright, uh, another visiting Fulbright chair uh, who led that report. And what they find is that uh, low frequency noise and vibrations are anecdotally linked to health impacts, um, but what they see most especially is that people who are annoyed by the turbine, people who see the turbines are more likely to be annoyed or impacted, right? So there's a certain amount of, I didn't like, and the people who aren't benefiting economically didn't like the wind turbines and felt they were being affected, right? So there's no physical link that's been drawn, there's no reason that we know of, no medical reason why that would suggest these negative health impacts, but we do observe people being negatively impacted uh, in part perhaps because they just don't like the turbines and then they feel impacted. On the other side of the coin, there are local benefits to having wind turbines. So uh, lease payment, if you own land that's going to get a turbine, um, uh, you're going to get lease payments. In the United States, the last number I heard was on the in ballpark uh, is $10,000 American per turbine per year. In northern New York, um, for the farmers in northern New York, that's a lot of money. Uh, that's a significant paycheck for most of them. That's a huge benefit. And it uh, benefits them. It also benefits their community. If it's more, the more money that's going around that community, the better it is. In addition, most municipalities that um, receive uh, that have wind turbines in their community will also receive, uh, in the United States we call them pilot payments, payments in lieu of taxes. So they'll be negotiated between the wind developer and the community to compensate the community for perceived costs of having these wind turbines. Okay, and those pilot payments um, will definitely benefit the community. They should either result in lower property taxes, increased services, or both. Right, and that's going to have a positive impact on the community. Uh, there's some literature about employment effects. Uh, these are going to be relatively small. Uh, this is not like a big 
a natural gas power plant where you need people around monitoring things, you're, you're looking at, once the turbines are built, you're probably looking at one or two employees, one or two jobs. Jobs are not the story for wind farms. Okay, so because of these benefits and costs, siting procedures can be very contentious, and I think my colleagues in the panel will talk more about this in particular. Um, communities can become divided, and I'm going to talk about one community that's not, uh, they don't have a wind farm yet. Um, but the way this worked was the developer came in, and I think my colleague will tell, me, tell you that this is exactly the wrong way to do things. But in this particular case, the developers came in and um, secretly signed lease payments with something with 75 to 90 percent of the leaseholders they were going to need. They signed those secretly, had gag orders on everyone, and then they announced it. And this created a lot of tension because you had people, local landowners, who were like, why didn't I get a lease payment? My neighbor got a lease payment, I'm not getting a lease payment, and everyone got very upset about this. So you end up with, this can be a very contentious um, situation, and so how developers go about this is going to be uh, very important. Um, another issue that comes up in New York State is that in New York State, because we've had, they've been trying to develop wind and other uh, power resources, and every time they try and do this, it gets, um, it becomes a very fraught process. Towns sort of sit on their hands. They can't decide what to do. And so New York State stepped in and uh, passed Article 10. Article 10 says that uh, the state can overrule local community zoning laws in order to cite uh, wind, uh, energy facilities that are in the public interest, basically. Uh, you can imagine how this goes over with local communities. This is <laughs> not at all, okay? Um, so these local issues are going to become very important, and how developers manage these local issues are critical to having wind facilities cited. All right, so like I said, uh, I'm going to focus on property values. And so let me just quickly review the literature on property value impacts from wind turbines. It's decidedly mixed. Um, so for the first several years of the people who were working on this literature, uh, there was basically no effect that was being found. So Hohen et al. Uh, and a couple of studies that were first um, uh, Department of Energy working papers and became published, they used a large data set from around the United States they physically visit like every house in their data set. It's very impressive. Um, and they found no significant impacts. Okay, and this is very, this was very, uh, um, very influential results. Um, the fact that they used a large sample from around the country got them around a particular problem that we'll face in this paper and that most studies of property values on wind turbines face, which is a low number of transactions. We don't have a lot of homes transacting right next to wind turbines. That's the problem most of these studies have faced. They overcame that by using a really big sample from all over the country and pooling it all together. I'll talk about more about what that means later. Um, uh, my colleague, Richard Vine and McCullough, find significant impact, find no significant impacts in rural western Ontario. Uh, that paper came out in 2014. Uh, Lang, Opaluk, and Finneralakis um, study a number of sites in Rhode Island, find no significant uh, impacts. Importantly, they are studying either single turbines or um, non-industrial scale turbines. That's an important difference. Um, Laposa and Mueller look at uh, a proposed facility in Colorado. They're looking for announcement effects, basically seeing people's expectations change, and they don't find anything, but the turbines weren't built. So uh, those of you economists in the room, rational expectations, well, of course we shouldn't, if the turbines don't end up getting built, then people should have foresaw that, and that's going to weaken their results as well. And Schultz looks at ag agricultural land values, finds no impact, but he's using assessment data versus transaction data, and there's some issues associated with that. In particular, if when you're using assessment data, if the assessor specifically does not account for an effect of wind turbines. If the assessor doesn't think there's an effect from wind turbines, you're not going to find an effect from wind turbines. Um, so that's uh, one of the reasons why we prefer studies with transactions when we're doing this kind of analysis. Okay, 
Uh, more recently, well, not all more recently, but uh, in the last few years, we've started to see more studies finding significant negative impacts uh, from wind turbines. Myself, uh, with a PhD student, Carrie Tuttle, uh, found significant impacts in two of three counties in northern New York. Okay, let me um, go back to that picture. Okay, so we found significant negative impacts here. No significant negative impacts here. And what do I think, why is that? Is, you know, uh, why would that be happening? Well, for one thing, you probably can't see it because of the, it's dark, but there's a village here, uh, the village of Shattigan, New York. Uh, small village, but uh, I don't know, probably 2,000, 3,000 people, something like that. They are surrounded by these wind turbines. Right, the wind turbines are intermixed amongst the community. You are, when you're in Chattagay, you can see a lot of turbines. Okay. Uh, in the Maple Ridge Project in Jefferson County, uh, these turbines are up on what's called the Tug Hill Plateau. If you're big into snowmobiling, this is like the, the mecca for snowmobiling in northern New York. So the Tug Hill Plateau, it's a windy, snowy place. The turbines are up on the plateau. No, virtually no one lives up on top of the plateau. So from the nearest town of Lowville, which probably has five or 6,000 people, from Lowville, you can look off to the distance, I'm guessing, I'm gonna say five miles, off into the distance up on the plateau, you'll see the turbines, but they're not in and amongst the community. There are very few parcels, very few residences up on the plateau next to the wind turbines. So this tells me that context matters where you put the turbines and how they're situated in amongst the community is going to matter a lot. The other thing, and this news came out after my paper was published, unfortunately, but uh, I started to see articles about how the Lowville Central Schools, so long story short, New York State uh, doesn't do very well by small rural school districts. Okay, the way funding for schools works in New York State does not benefit small rural areas. And if you've not been in northern New York, it's an extremely rural area. Um, so as a result, in North Country, as we call it, uh, uh, most school districts have been cutting budgets left and right. They've been cutting teacher slots. Class sizes are getting bigger. All of this is happening. Not in Lowville. And all the anecdotes, all the stories that people are telling about this revolve around those wind turbines. Lowville Central Schools is getting enough money in pilot payments from the developer that they're able to grow their school system, improve their class sizes. Uh, everything's getting better in the Lowville Central Schools district, not so in the rest of the North Country. I don't know, I don't, you don't hear similar stories coming out of here, and I don't know exactly what the pilot payment structure is, um, but I do know that it's favorable for Maple Ridge. Okay? So, these particulars are going to matter. These, how the communities are compensated is going to matter. The other thing that I want to say about this is that, so this study that I did looked at three communities in northern New York, very similar rural communities, um, very close to the border with Canada. They're very similar places. And I found different results in different places. This makes me really skeptical of big studies that use the sites from all over the country and pool their sample. Because they're finding no significant impacts, but they might be a sort of, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna make it sound explicit. Uh, they might be by accident, they might be sort of glossing over significant impacts in one place or another. But when you average it all out over the court, over the, all these samples, the effects go away. So I'm very skeptical of big studies that use uh, multiple sites because if I'm not able to pool the data from three communities in northern New York, I don't know how you can successfully pool the data between Pennsylvania and Washington State. Right, those are very different places. Okay, so, uh, and then there's a series of studies since then that have uh, continued to find negative impacts. Uh, the Gibbons paper really focuses on visibility. It's an excellent paper. Um, they find significant negative impacts in the, Uni in the United Kingdom. And Jensen, uh, Panduro, and Lundheed in Denmark 
they have a really large sample, all really close to the turbines. Um, it's a spectacular data set. Um, and they find significant negative impacts both from visibility and from noise effects. Okay, so we again, so what we have here is we have uh, variation in studies we've got from all over the world, some finding no effect, some finding a negative impact. Um, the literature is decidedly mixed, and I think that's uh, important to realize. When we ask people, though, it's not very mixed. Okay, when you ask people, do you want wind turbines in your backyard, the answer is no, um, by and large. People are willing to pay to avoid it. Um, they would demand compensation. They're not going to travel as much to the beach if there's wind turbines off in the distance. Right? If you ask people these things, they say no. Okay, so there's a little bit of a, uh, there's lots of stories we can tell about why, this, why there might be a difference between the revealed preference studies, the hedonic studies, and the stated preference studies. But nonetheless, we see that at least their state, when, there's, when people are asked, they don't really want, people don't like change. That's my, that's my nice story. As I get older and I realize that people just don't like things to change. They don't like their landscape to change. They bought a house. They don't want their view to change. Um, and, and wind turbines are a change. Okay. Ask you a sure. Are those, are those no effect studies inconsistent with the effect studies? Because they all are in, like they all have some measure of imprecision associated with them, right? Sure. So does the measure does, does their no effect uh, span the negative effects that you're finding in the other one? So are the sample sizes just too small? In other words, on those no effect studies? <laughs> I'm not supposed to be asking questions in the middle of this, probably. The How dare you, Nick? I'll, I'll, I'll let it pass. Uh, so what I was asking was, you know, it, for example, in the medical literature, uh, we do meta-analysis, right? Because a lot of times we get a bunch of studies that say no effect, but the reason they're saying no effect is because the sample sizes are right. small. And so we do these meta-analyses which combine all the effects of, you know, a certain drug on your heart, and we find that even though a whole bunch of individual studies might say, oh, there's nothing there, uh, when we put them all together, we aggregate all the sample sizes, we might come up with a precisely estimated positive or negative effect. And I'm just asking, are these studies that say there's no effect, are they just underpowered? Do they have not big enough samples? Or are they actually different numbers than, uh, statistically different numbers than those studies that show negative effects? Uh, so I think that's a really good question. And, and honestly, as I was preparing for this talk this afternoon, I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I should really do a meta-analysis. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. Yes. Uh, uh, I think that's something that has to be done. I'll say that it's not all about sample size in these particular studies. So the Hohen study, um, they have a huge sample. Uh, I think the reason they don't find effect is, like I said, because they, they're sort of pooling everything together instead of looking at individual sites. Um, uh, the Vine and McCulloch paper is, uh, in, uh, their sample is about the same as my 2012 paper. The Lang study, uh, that has a lot of data as well, um, but it's the difference in the different kinds of turbines, right, and the different setups. So I think that's, um, I think a meta-analysis is beginning, we're beginning to have enough literature where a meta-analysis is called for and we can start looking at these issues. Okay, good. Okay, so conclusions of all this, local context matters, the setting of the turbines, the size and type of turbines, uh, how communities are compensated, um, and the distribution, I haven't talked about this, but the distribution of homeowners between full-time and uh, vacation rentals. We'll talk about that in a second. So here is uh, the Wolf Island situation. So it's, uh, it's Canadian Island on the St. Lawrence River just at the eastern end of Lake Ontario right there. Um, that's a blow-up of the, of the island. This is, um, this is Kingston over here, roughly. There, uh, and that's Cape Vincent. Uh, that's the village in New York State. That's the focus, really the focus of the controversy around this study from the U.S. perspective. Uh, the turbines were built in June of 2009. Uh, there are 86 turbines, 197, 198 megawatts. Okay, it's a pretty uh, big facility. And if you look back at that picture, I hate to keep flipping back. Oops, I went the wrong way, didn't I? Um, I hate to keep flipping back and forth. But there's a lot of them, right? This is a, a, dominates the landscape on the western side of the island, for sure. What is the population of that? Uh, so I'm not sure what the po uh, Stuart might be able to help me with that one. I want to say it's 1,000? Yeah, I think 1,200. 1,200. And there's no bridge. 
Uh, no, there's a ferry to Kingston, right, but no bridge. That's right. Okay, so on the Canadian side, we have terminate, turbines dominating the landscape, uh, mostly agricultural parcels with some residential parcels on the island. Uh, you can see the, uh, the you can see the turbines from Kingston. Uh, there was a there was an approval process that involved to some extent the local community. Um, there's a six hundred fifty thousand dollar Canadian uh, annual payment to the to Frontenac Township. Um, Forty seven landowners uh, receive lease payments, and a third of the homes are seasonal or vacation homes. That's on the Canadian side. On the U.S. side. Uh, the turbines are off in a distance. The closest house, the closest parcel to a turbine on the on the U.S. side, I think, is 1.86 miles. Okay, um, but they are definitely, you know, a view of the water. You know, you look out over the water uh, and you see the turbines on the island in the background. There's a significant population of second homes. I don't know what that share is, but I think it's a big. I think it's bigger than a third, um, especially those homes that are on the water with a water view are disproportionately going to be second homes. And just to give you a sense, uh, hopefully that's the next slide. Um, and obviously they had no view of the, um, sorry, no role in the approval process being on the other side of the border. So uh, these, are, these are perceptions. Uh, as the Americans were getting ready, people were starting to pay attention to these turbines. Note all in 2009, right before they were finished. Um, uh, wind turbines are going to take away the beauty of my township. Uh, they're a blight on the landscape. They're a jolt to the entire landscape, like a jab in the ribs. Uh, ex post, people, the realtors are saying, uh, this is my favorite quote, uh, your sophisticated buyer with a sense of design and architecture is not going to want to look at those turbines. Okay, so you're left with only unsophisticated buyers. You know how that's going to end up, okay? Um, they're going to move, and that's actually, they'll come up towards Clayton and Alex Bay. So that's actually important because, indeed, in Jefferson County and then over to the next county, St. Lawrence County, there's a long stretch of vacation home areas all on the river in part of the Thousand Islands region. And then further south, uh, there's a stretch of vacation homes along the Lake Ontario, right? So even if you wanted to stay, even if you really want your vacation home in northern New York, you have a lot of options, Okay. Um, this is on the Canadian side. Uh, maybe that in the future a buyer will, buyer will simply refuse to purchase a property within the vicinity of a wind turbine. If there's no buyer, there's no value. Um, I think that's a bit extreme, again, because if someone wa I, there's always a value, right? I mean, as economists, if you're an economist, we know that there's always a value. I will buy anyone's home for $5. So uh, there's a value. Uh, it might be low, but there's a value. Okay, so uh, standard hedonic analysis, uh, this is for uh, the, the economists in the room, the log linear functional form, local area fixed effects to control for omitted variables bias. Um, we are going to use municipality level here, which is a bit bigger scale than I would prefer, um, but we do have a sample size problem. Um, errors are clustered to deal with spatial autocorrelation. We're going to look at view and we're going to look at distance. And our results are going to be quite consistent to those two measures. Um, in particular, the variable, I have it highlighted in my tables, but the variable we're most interested in is the interaction term between uh, wind you know, being after the wind turbines are constructed and having a view of the turbines. Okay, that's the variable we're interested in because we want to know, like, we want, basically want to be looking at the sample of homes that would have a view of the turbines once they're constructed and we want to see how their property values change after the turbines are built. That's the interesting uh, variable. So that's what we're going to focus on. We include year and month uh, fixed effects to control for sample-wide trends in seasonality. This is actually critical in this sample because you'll, you might remember uh, looking over the border with glee uh, in the late... Uh, 2000s as American property values went down the drain, right? And you here in Canada continued your boom. Right? Uh, so you may recall property values in the United States went through a bit of a dive uh, during this sample. So we're going to have to control for that and we uh, at least uh, we, I think we have a pretty good handle on it. I'll also say that um, 
Northern New York being where it is, so isolated from the rest of the world, um, we did not, we were not severely impacted. There's no big dive in our property values. You do see a leveling off, but you don't see a big drop. It's not like Florida where you saw 50, 60% drops in property values. Okay, so we have 8,000 residential transactions, 6,000 New York, 2,000 Ontario. Um, our, in New York State, our data comes from the New York State Office of Real Property Taxation Services. Um, parcel polygons uh, come from Jefferson County themselves. And our data on New York side spans January 2004 to June 2013. In Ontario, everything comes from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. Data spans September 2004 to July 2013. Both data sets are augmented using GIS analysis to account for spatial factors. So here's our map of transactions, and this is the map I was wanting to point out to you. So first of all, right, so we have a lot of control transactions. So that's one thing, right? So obviously these parcels up here are not relevant to wind turbines down here. Same with these transactions down here. So we've got a lot of control transactions, but that's important. The other thing I wanted to point out about this is this line. Okay, those are waterfront parcels. You'll see how a lot of the parcels on the New York side are clustered along the water. My sense is that almost all of those, certainly not all, but many, very many of those are second homes. Those are vacation homes with water views. Okay, these are people who are likely going to be the most impacted, the most likely to uh, react to a change in their landscape. Okay, unfortunately, I do not know which parcels are second homes and which ones aren't. There's a dummy for seasonal, for it being a seasonal home, but that seasonality reflects whether it is, whether you can live there in the winter, uh, which is not the same thing as being a vacation home. You'll have a lot of these homes um, are winterized. A lot of the vacation homes on the water are winterized, um, even if they're still seasonal homes. Okay, so the other thing we did was that um, uh, we can try and model the views of these turbines from using computers, using GIS, geographical information systems. This is a highly error-prone process. So what we did was we had two students, one from Guelph and one from uh, visiting Clark Sarah, the co-author, uh, visiting us from Middlebury, um, drove to every parcel that had a, every transacted parcel that had a potential view of these turbines and was within five miles of the turbines uh, and looked. Uh, obviously, we didn't go into the home, we didn't trespass, uh, but we looked from the street, got a sense. Are they likely to be able to see turbines uh, from this parcel? Okay. Um, we find 54 parcel with views that sell after the turbine construction when you add up the two sides. That's a small number. That's a problem. Uh, it's an unfortunate, unfortunate fact of life uh, right now for just people doing studies of wind turbines. Okay, so we're going to want to control for all sorts of things. So obviously we want to control for distance and view. I already said we're worried about this interaction term between view and the timing of construction or announcement of the, of the turbines. Our baseline dates that we're going to worry about are construction completed in June of 2009 uh, and announced in April of 2007. That's, those will be our baseline sort of timing variables. Um, we will then test an alternate construction, which is if the, when the construction began in May of 2008 and when bylaw, zoning bylaw amendments were passed in November 2006. Of course, the specifics of the timing actually could potentially matter a lot. Um, and that's why we want to test for this, because uh, if people were paying attention and knew that the turbines were coming uh, and we put them in the pre-turbine phase, then that's going to bias our results towards zero. So we want to be careful about that and test some different things. Um, we have the standard structural controls, bedrooms, bathrooms, lot size, uh, square footage of the home, whether there's a fireplace. We have a measure of the condition of the home from assessment data, uh, air conditioning, age, et cetera. Okay? A whole series of variables there. And we have a few proximity variables, uh, whether uh, distance to the nearest town, city, 
and whether or not the home is waterfront or not. Okay. Um, we had more proximity variables, but they were all highly collinear, and that was messing with our estimates. And so we cut it down uh, based on variance inflation factors. We cut it down to those two in particular, the town and the city. All right. So how am I doing on time, by the way? Yeah, pretty good. Okay. So um, here are our results. This is using turbine view as the main variable of interest. So whether or not a parcel can view the turbine. We originally, our students went out and they reported partial view, full view, um, you know, multiple turbine views. Um, but with only 54 parcels that had any view at all, it was going to, we did not have enough variation to identify differences in how big the view was. Okay, so we're just going to use whether there's a view or not. And what we see is, um, this is, these, this is sort of the headline result. So in Ontario, if you're a parcel with a view after construction, nothing happens. Okay. In New York State, uh, we get that negative. That's you know that's going to be something like uh, something like a 14% reduction in property values for homes that have a view after the turbines are built. Okay. Now you'll notice a couple other things. Um, uh, this is basically in saying that after turbines were built, uh, average prices in our sample on the New York side went down by 17%. That's likely not attributable to um, the turbines themselves. That's attributable to general sample-wide trends um, associated with the downturn. Uh, we also see that if you had a view of the turbines in the announcement period, it was a big positive impact. That uh, it might be hard to explain, but I think what that's probably telling us is that uh, the waterfront homes were re relatively immune to, these, to this negative trend that was going on. Okay? But we're not sure exactly what's causing that. What we do see is that after the turbines are built, if you can see the turbines, there's a big 14% uh, negative impact. You'll notice that being waterfront on its own is a huge positive. Seasonal is positive as well. Um, which is negative in Ontario. Uh, this seasonal variable is different on both sides of the border. The Ontario assessors use a different definition of seasonal than the New York assessors, so I'm not going to put too much stock in that difference. Stefan has a question. I think we need a mic for him. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I might have missed that, but did you also interact view and distance? I, I think you talked about that earlier. but So... Uh, we're going to show distance results in a second. Um, we tried interacting view with distance. Um, we, we tried actually a number of other... Uh, actually, let me get to it. How's okay. that? Sorry. I'll get to it. No, that's fine. Okay. So if we just look at distance, uh, very similar results obtained. Okay. So uh, this basically means being close to turbines before or after they're built is... Uh, is bad for property values. This is the one. This is the one we care about. Uh, being uh, closer to the turbines is bad for property values in New York. It's, if anything, positive in uh, Ontario. Okay. So it's basically the same result. Don't worry about the co size of that coefficient. It's a complicated. It would take me a number of mathematical steps to go back and figure out exactly what that implies in terms of property values, besides it being negative. Okay, these numbers are starting to get small, and I apologize for that. Um, these are robustness checks. So what we do here is we look at um, the alternative announcement and construction dates. So this first set of columns alters our construction. So now we're looking at uh, when construction starts as our timeline. We get basically the same result. Okay, This alters the announcement date leaves the construction date the same. Uh, the announcement date, same basic result. This is if we look just at homes within five miles of the turbines. So cutting out all those homes that aren't really relevant. Okay, so if we cut our sample down, I'm, I get nervous about this because we do have the numbers problem. Um, actually, you can see what our numbers problem is <laughs> right there. Uh, very few transactions right in close. Uh, when we do that, uh, we do still see a big negative impact on New York. Um, 
perhaps too big to be believed, I suspect um, that's a small numbers problem. So there's probably something, uh, some omitted variable or something particular about these homes that we're observing that's causing that very large number. I'll also point out that it's very similar to this number that is the effect of having a view. And so it's basically washing out whatever the positive impact is from having a view of Wolf Island irrespective, without regard to whether the uh, turbines are built yet. Um, it basically washes that out. But I'm very skeptical of these results because of the number of observations. OK, this is the same thing, only using the distance instead of the view as our variable of interest. And when we do that, again, very similar to the results. Uh, changing the, the construction period does not change. Changing the announcement date does. Um, that we need to look into some more. And the five miles goes crazy. Um, so I don't believe those results at all, frankly. Um, there are too few observations, and these, these coefficients are huge. That's, uh, that's like a 200. That's more than a 200% uh, impact, uh, although I have to think about exactly the interpretation, but those numbers are, those coefficients are way too large. Um, so I don't, we just have too few observations. To Stefan's point about other uh, robustness checks. So um, it was suggested to us, and rightly so, that indeed time trends uh, might vary being waterfront or not. So we tried interacting everything with being waterfront to see if, there's, if these coefficients are different for waterfront homes versus non-waterfront homes. Um, it really, we got a lot of results, oops, we got a lot of results like this, these really big numbers, uh, because our observation, we just don't have enough observations. Every time we interacted and started cutting the data in more ways, we lost statistical power. And the results were a little screwy. Um, the variance inflation factors, for instance, were off the charts. So we had a lot of autocorrelation, a lot of um, uh, multicollinearity going on. Uh, so we tried interacting with uh, uh, waterfront. We tried interacting distance and view to see if being close to the view mattered more than being having a distant view. The issue there is that. Um, in New York State, every home is, is at quite a distance, right? Every home in New York State is at least uh, more than a mile and a half away from the turbines. So no one's right up close to them. And so if we start, as we start cutting, those dis cutting it with those interaction terms, uh, it starts getting, again, we start losing power. And so that's a big problem with, uh, with these small sample sizes that we run into over and over again. The more we cut this data, the harder it is to believe the results. OK. So, to summarize what this all what this all said, so um, we have uh, I think reasonably strong evidence that there's negative impacts from property on property values from these turbines on the New York side of the border. We get basically no effect on the Canadian side of the border. Okay, so uh, very little impact on Wolf Island itself. Um, at first, this is hard to explain. But I think we can begin to explain in a few ways. For one, uh, there is compensation. You have those 47, home, 47 homeowners out of roughly 1,200 uh, that are getting substantial uh, compensation in terms of their own lease payments. We're getting, the township is getting $650,000 a year, which isn't a huge sum of money, but it doesn't, it's nothing. It's not anything to sneeze at. Um, uh, I strongly suspect we have more vacation homes in New York State versus on Wolf Island, suggesting that these might uh, be more likely to flee a change in, in, um, in view. And of course, the Americans had no part of the process. So from the American perspective, it's the Canadians are sort of foisting these turbines on the Americans. Okay. Um, and this continues to tell me this continues to strengthen my general feeling about this literature, which is that the context really matters, and that's what this shows. Now we're looking at the same wind farm, just with two different samples on either side of the border, and we're getting different impacts. Really suggests to me that the 
local context for wind development really matters about the results. We are not going to be able to answer a question. There, there is no broad answer. Do wind turbines hurt property values? There's no single answer to that question. It depends on the location. Okay, so that's all. I will answer questions in a second, but before I do, I just want to thank a few people. Uh, I want to thank the Clarkson University Research Experience for Undergraduates program, which brought Sarah, Gru Sarah Guth to my campus. Um, that's funded by the National Science Foundation. Adam Bonnycastle at Guelph provided GIS assistance, and Brittany Berry at Guelph and Tuan Tang at Clarkson provided additional research assistance, so I want to make sure that they all get their proper due. And with that, I'll... Should I answer questions now, or do we want to have the other panelists first? Panelists come, then we'll go. Perfect. There you go. Okay, thank you, Martin. Um, so we've got two panelists who are going to comment on this talk for us today, and then we'll open up for some questions at the end. Uh, we're very lucky to have our first panelist has just, uh, just joined us here at the University of Ottawa as a senior research associate for the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy, and also for the Positive Energy Project. Uh, so this is Dr. Stuart Fast. Um, he was previously a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Queen's University Institute for Energy and Environmental Policy. Um, He's also on the board for the Ontario Renewable Energy Cooperative, which is interesting. So I'll uh, turn it over to Stuart. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, so during my postdoc at Queen's, I actually spent quite a bit of time with looking at five different wind energy projects, including the one on Wolf Island. So it's a pleasure to, to come back and, and, and look at the, a different perspective, a different research on this. So um, what I'm going to try and do today is, is take maybe five, ten minutes to go over uh, a couple, some of the findings and I think some of the implications and maybe suggest some directions that it might take us. And then I'd also like to dig into a little bit of some of the interpretation of the data that you were showing in, in those tables there. Uh, but first, let me start out by saying I found the paper uh, very clearly written, well read, and, uh, and just as Martin has explained it, he's, he's, he has a good, uh, uh, he, he, does, he does well to explain the implications of different met methodological choices over others, so uh, it's a real pleasure to read it. Solid, solid piece of research. Okay, so I want to start off what I think the main messages are here. So, as I see it, the property values that are in jurisdictions responsible for in, in approving and taxing the wind, the, the wind farm are not affected or possibly even increased based on the, based on proximity to the wind farm. Second to that is that property values that are not in the jurisdiction but within sight and proximity of the wind project are negatively impacted. So the explanation for this difference that Martin's given us is, is uh, a few, few possibilities. One is that there's a compensation effect that is reducing this willingness to, uh, or reducing the tendency for a willingness to not accept uh, a, a disamenity in view, and also something about uh, the process. So I think it's very important then that we look at the Wolf Island project and say, and to look at the specifics of that project. So one of the very important point is that the local residents were involved in planning stages because at that point, at the time of the, the, the Wolf, energy, Wolf Island Energy Project, local zoning approval was required. Now that's something that has changed in Ontario after 2009. So I think that's, that is a, that's a major point now. It's, um, uh, it's, it's, so in 2009, the, as many of you will know, the Green Energy Act tried to centralize and streamline the approval process for wind energy projects. One of the, one of the steps taken was to uh, remove the requirement for local zoning approval. Now, if we take Martin's point that that, has, uh, that that is an important feature of making sure there are no negative property value impacts, then I think the implication is that uh, some of the, 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 uh, the trend towards a more centralized approval process is, is probably the wrong direction, at least on that property value aspect. Now, the, the second major implication I see from his findings uh, is that... So he, you made the point in the, in the introduction about this idea that uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions and renewable energies, it's a global public good. Um, and, and, and that they, so that public good cannot be contained within the territory in which it has been produced, so in Ontario and the Wolf Island example. And if we accept your premise that the New York property values are being negatively affected by activities in Ontario and therefore creating a public bad or an externality, there should be an equal recognition that climate benefits are a public good accruing to New York property owners and to, in fact, anyone, every, the global population. So if there is a role for public policy to find a way to compensate New York property owners, 
then this should be tied to greenhouse gas benefits that are being received from the, the, the Ontario Wind Energy Project. So that's the other, that's the other implication. And the other point of that is that uh, as many who follow the Ontario wind energy situation will know that there's a, a lot of times when there's excess wind energy production in Ontario, it's sold to New York at, a, at a quite a reduced rate. So, I mean, not only is there this potential greenhouse gas benefit that's accruing to New Yorkers and, and the entire population, but New York rate payers are benefiting from low price to wind power at the other end as well. So those are, so if we're thinking about policy remedies for the situation that is described, then I think it's important to look to, to recognize those things. Okay, the, the other, I want to get to some of the interpretation of data questions as well. So one of the, and I don't know if we can bring it back up table two if possible. But so the table two, which was, as you put it, the headline of your, of your, of your findings, uh, is, shows that uh, turbine view variable has, uh, you know, I'd like to see it here, but the general, yeah, there we go. So there are two things that, I, that I'd like to ask Martin from here, and, and one is uh, how do we interpret a, this kind of low R squared value in, in the New York example versus the Ontario example? Does that mean that there is a missing variable, and is that, is that, is that, how, how do we interpret that? The second thing is the, um, the second thing is, is, so we see a negative, we see a reduction in price after the announcement. And this, this effect seems to be more neg more a, 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 a larger effect than the ones that are close to the turbines or within view of the turbines. So is, is, is one explanation, so is, is a, a possible alternate explanation, not that this is necessarily the view of the turbines that's creating this negative, uh, this statistically negative reduction, but that the view of the turbines or the proxy view of water is moderating this larger negative effect uh, just for after po post recession or the, the recession effect. So that's that's one thing, and then the R squared thing. So those that's the only bit in the, the weeds that I want to get to, but but I thought I'd I'd like to raise that. So um, I, I think yeah. I need a mic. <laughs> Uh, I'm like the last person in the world who needs a mic. I have a really loud voice when I need it, but um, it's recorded and they need a mic. Anyway, uh, so the R squared, um, this is uh, every hedonic analysis I've done in New York State, this is what I get. I don't know why um, it's consistent no matter what we do in the Ontario Canada, uh, versus New York Realm, yeah, we get a relative, we get a lower, relatively lower R squared. I'm not too worried about it. Um, we're using fixed effects, um, so that's I don't know, uh, but it's consistent. And I don't worry too much about it historically. Um, the other about the interpretation. So the announcement variable, what that is telling us is that controlling for annual sample-wide trends. Post-announcement, property values in New York State went, in sorry, in our sample yeah. of New York State, went down somewhat. They went down further, an additional like seven and a half percent um, after construction right. in our sample. The then what we're doing is we're um, looking at those houses with a view. And when we look at the house with a view, in the announcement period, it's positive and large. And in the uh, post-construction period with a view, it's negative and semi. So that's actually, um, that's essentially mod that's, that's modifying the post-construction result. So essentially, that post-construction result is saying there's roughly a 17% decline in property values. This is an additional 14% beyond what is already happening post-construction sample wise. So it's additional, not... No. Those aren't, but you, you can't compare them to each other. They, they're additive. Great. Instead. Okay. That's okay. good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, uh, the, okay, great. The, the, the other, uh, another point that I'd like to bring up is that uh, we often see, so I do a little bit more survey uh, research or a little bit more familiar with that literature, so a public opinion research, which shows often that there's what they call a, a U 
shape in public opinion. So as a, as a project like an announced, support for wind energy and for the, and the local project is high. As it's built, there's this and constructed, opinion will go down and then it, it returns back after four or five years. Um, so which, it, which seems to suggest another question is that what happens if we would, were to look at the transactions that are happening now, 2016, versus the ones that are happening 2009, 2010, kind of immediately at the, at the construction phase. So that's, uh, maybe that's a next step for research, but I want to raise that, and I think it would be interesting to you know, contrast to public opinion research, which we have seen for Wolf Island and has published an, an, an increase from about 55 to 60 percent support to now 65 percent support in over that same time period. Um, I also very sympathetic to one of his concluding ideas that the place matters. I mean, as a, as a geographer, we love to we love to hear that sort of thing. Um, it seems to depend on local factors, including planning and revenue sharing. I, I do wonder why he didn't didn't make a little bit more uh, draw a little bit more attention to some of the positive uh, value effects that seem to be reported in the Ontario case. So it was not as significant in as the negative effect, but there was a significant positive effect in one of your in one of your tables, not this one, but the one for for distance. But when you restrict it as well to the properties within five miles, it, that can, that significant positive results was was uh, was consistent. So uh, make more uh, interested in, in why you didn't make more of that. And finally, I just want to point out that wind energy projects are not the only type of energy infrastructure to have impact on property values. I think if you look at the National Energy Board, they're right now looking at um, uh, the, the different pipeline proposals. They've commissioned property value assessments of or property value impacts of oil and gas pipelines. And, and there's, it's unequivocal that when there are pipeline spills, not surprisingly, property values decline. Um, so it's, I think, also important to put that, that in context. I mean, all sorts of energy infrastructure is going to have property value impacts. Uh, and which is probably a good point to make a little pitch for the, the, the project that I'm working on right now, which is the positive energy project that Jeff mentioned. We're looking at six different uh, energy types, energy projects across Canada. Uh, the Northern Gateway Pipeline in Kitimat, uh, transmission, electricity transmission line in Alberta, a 200 megawatt uh, run of river project in Manitoba, the, uh, the GTA gas plant uh, fiascos in the GTA region, the uh, wind energy project in Quebec, and, and uh, shale oil in New Brunswick. So the point of this project is to kind of figure out what are factors that lead to greater satisfaction in the energy regulatory process, siting process. So we're looking at, we're doing interviews and polling. Uh, so property values are part of it, but there's, a, of course, a a lot of other things that go into it. So if you're interested in that, I'm happy to talk, talk, uh, talk about that later. But that's all I'd like to say. And again, I'd just like to summarize that I think this is a, a, a very well done piece of research and, and I'll leave it up, leave it there for, for Tom. Um, our, our second um, respondent, uh, we want to bring you something a little bit different. Uh, we have Tom Levy, who's uh, the Director of Technical and Utility Affairs at the Canadian Wind Energy Association. And so Tom is going to speak a little bit to the results of the study, but he's also, we asked him to sort of frame for you from Camwea's perspective, sort of the current policy for wind energy in Ontario and the current sort of the policy framework in Canada uh, around this study. So uh, Tim is also a professional engineer with over 10 years of experience in environmental engineering and has worked as a consultant to the wind energy for nearly seven years, primarily involved in planning environmental assessments and development of wind farms. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Good afternoon. Um, I got a few things I'll go through. I'll go through that as well. I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna go into the tables. And I'm not gonna look at your R squared. Although I did point, I did notice that as well. And uh, but I figured Stuart would bring that up. Um, so yeah, very happy to be invited. Thank you, uh, Jeff and, uh, and Fulbright for uh, for bringing us here and uh, giving us a chance to uh, kind of share our perspective and thoughts. Uh, why why wind is uh, is a subject matter of the day. Um, I think if you go around most places, it's uh, it's top of mind. Um, you know, at the association level, we're always looking at you know the latest studies, the latest information, whether that's property values or or health or uh, you know a myriad of other uh, other issues that uh, that an industry like wind is is facing because it's a growing input onto the system, and and as it grows, people start paying more attention to some of the edge effects that uh, 
you know, decades ago, maybe people ignored. Um, obviously, property value is one of them. So we're, we're very pleased to see these healthy, robust conversations. I think they're frankly important. They're, they're um, help us understand, you know, mistakes that were made or not made or successes that were made or not made and how do you reproduce those, what, what led to those successes or failures or whatnot. Um, and, and frankly, that's that dialogue um, that's of fundamental importance and, and uh, researchers like, uh, like Stuart are, are, are very much contributing to that and we thank you for that. Um, I, think, I think when you are able to kind of tease out information and, 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 and better understand a situation, it obviously helps you improve it the next time or so on. And certainly the wind industry is always seeking new ways to improve itself, I think, as any industry would. Um, I think another thing that this industry has demonstrated is it can be very successful in many different jurisdictions and in many different policy environments. We don't set the policy. We don't set the policy in, in Ontario or Alberta or, or Nova Scotia. Um, the industry works within those policies that are provided. Obviously, there's advocacy efforts that are, that are, that are uh, discussed and pushed in terms of things that, that, that will help an industry and, and, and help it survive within, within you know, environments like Alberta, which are, which are arguably unstable. Um, and frankly, no one's making any money in Alberta right now with the pool prices, in some cases, dropping as low as 20 bucks. Um, we, we certainly understand why wind is here. It's, it's here because if you paid attention to Paris and all the other co-ops that came after that, uh, came before that, um, we have an urgent need to deal with our, our power system, our transportation system, um, our heat and power, and, and all of that is, is, is driven by uh, thermal sources of power. 98% uh, of the world's um, power is, is, is provided by fossil fuels and, and hydro, uh, both of which consume or, or divert vast amounts of water. Um, it is a, uh, a critical area of need, and, and there's many arid regions that, that are not going to be benefiting from, from large water-consuming um, industries. Um, <clears throat> so we're very happy to see uh, uh, discussions like this and, and, and obviously are happy to have a, an opportunity to, to respond um, and be a, part of, uh, be a part of that conversation. I'm just going to walk through this um, and then, uh, of course, happy to enter into any kind of conversation or discussion people want to have, answer questions or whatnot. So. So we just go through this. I'm just going to click it. All right. So this is actually all. We're now at 11.2 gigawatts in Canada. We installed about 1,500 megawatts of wind last year, 1,800 megawatts the year before. Um, rapid growth, um, and it's been driven through a number of reasons, and, and we'll go through some of those. Um, you know, we're we're seeing four or five percent of our demand met by wind energy right now today in, in Canada, um, and uh, and that's continuing to grow. Um, again, the slide is, is, is slightly uh, older, over 720 megawatts to date in 2015 when that was written. We expected 1,500 megawatts. We got 1,505, 1,506 last year. Um, we're meeting our new procurement targets. We're exceeding those, um, and they're being reestablished and then exceeded again. Um, Nova Scotia is a great example. I had a reporter call me up and said, well, they canceled Comfit. What do you guys think about that? And we said, well, it's great. They met their targets. Um, in fact, they blew their targets out of the water, uh, and they blew those targets out of the water because of significant investment in wind. Um, at the community level, um, and uh, I think it's it's an important jurisdiction to to kind of point out the value of that community dialogue, community investment, um, and uh, and when you have money on the table, you're you're likely to look at it very differently than than if it's someone else's money, and you're just as you say you're 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 dealing with the negative consequences without having an opportunity to to either reap the rewards of those or or, or mitigate them within your powers. Um, this is this is Canada um, as a, as a whole. These are these are data that are often uh, that we that we glean from annual utility reports. Um, we're we're seeing some some leaders in the country, notably the Maritimes. Um, PEI hits over forty percent of its energy from wind, um, not an insignificant amount by any stretch. People talk about Denmark all the time. I like to talk about PEI. Um, it's uh, it's it's remarkable what they're doing there. Um, Fred O'Brien, who runs Maritime Electric, he's a great guy and he's very pragmatic and he's a very conservative fellow, as most utilities are. Um, they wouldn't bring that on if they couldn't, um, and they do. Um, <clears throat> you look at uh, you look at Nova Scotia. That's that's grown right now. It's sitting nine and a half percent. It was it was two or three percent five years ago, um, under a power system that 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 now sits around 500 megawatts of wind with a minimum load of 650 megawatts, which is an astounding um, thing to manage within that, uh, that very tight bandwidth. And they do it reliably. Um, and, and all of these jurisdictions in Canada are growing their portfolio of wind. Um, uh, certainly not quite to the extent that they are in the Maritimes, but uh, that's just the nature of the size of the power system. 
From the National Energy Board um, data, you can see that wind is the number one source of new power in Canada, and actually it's the number one source or number two or maybe three um, in most countries all around the world. Um, and, and frankly, I think it demonstrates that the contribution of conventional sources of power is, is shrinking in terms of the new capacity that's being brought online. Investments are increasingly being directed towards renewable energy, and that's for good reason, um, because we know that we cannot continue down the path that we're going down. <clears throat> So why is this happening? What are those drivers? Um, we'll get into that. Those drivers exist because of the evolution of this market. Um, in the, the, old, the old days, um, it, was, it was really, a, is there a way we can capture energy from the wind and we can make it do work for our benefit? And we can make it do work for our benefit without burning carbon to do, or burning fossil fuels and producing carbon to do that. Um, it, was, it was a notion driven by, actually, the oil prices at the time in the 70s. Um, that, that people thought there's got to be a better way. So these are the early designs. They're small, uh, individual one-offs, 100 kilowatts, 50 kilowatts, 10 kilowatts. Um, and those, those were really just, does it work? Can we actually capture wind um, and get that kinetic energy, turn it into mechanical energy, and, and make it do work for us? <clears throat> if you move into the wind 2.0, it was, yeah, we can make it do work. And how do we, make, how do we, how do we get the most benefit out of that? Um, the technology was developed um, to capitalize on those environmental attributes that it brings. So the WIND 2.0 notion was how do we best leverage those, those benefits? How do we best accrue those benefits to the greater good of society, of the, electric, of the bulk electric power system, um, and the people who use it? Once we got to that scale, though, the utility started saying, well, hang on, we can't manage the variability. We can't, man we can't deal with the uncertainty um, because I don't have a hopper I can just feed and dial up and dial down. I've got uncertain power flow um, driven by uncertain wind. Um, and, and so the industry had to respond. How do we deal with that uncertainty? How do we manage that variability? Um, and, and I think if you look around the world, uh, the evidence is quite clear that the industry has managed to respond by developing much smarter machines um, and machines that can respond much more quickly to demands from the system operator. If you ask the Ontario system operator today, the independent electricity system operator, what is the most flexible source of supply on the grid? I think you'd be surprised, but it's not a surprise to us. Wind is the most flexible supply on the grid. Um, it is extremely responsive, um, and the dispatchability of wind is being viewed upon as an attribute and not a crutch. Um, the system operators simply wouldn't bring this much on if they couldn't manage it, if it was going to cause reliability concerns. And the fact remains is it isn't causing reliability concerns because they have those tools available to manage that variability, to reduce the uncertainty. Um, and ultimately, when you've done that, you're able to fully realize the benefits and the attributes that the technology brings to the grid. But it needed to be low cost, it needed to be highly flexible, and it needed to be a good citizen on the grid, providing voltage control or at least riding through blips on the system when those would occur, frequency response and voltage response and all of that. <clears throat> the end result, of course, is that wind is now becoming, again, one of the lowest cost sources of power that you can procure on the grid. It's beating conventionals on cost. It's beating conventionals on environmental attributes. Um, and it's beating, it's starting to beat conventionals on the grid qualities that it brings. Um, there are power plants in the U.S. from wind projects that are extremely sophisticated and are following load. Um, there's not many that can do that. Uh, there are a few, obviously, in terms of natural gas and so on. Um, but increasingly, we're finding that wind is actually bringing reliability to the grid and not taking away, as, in, as initially was thought. So why is all that fuss? Those attributes that, that were demanded by the system operator have resulted in benefits for the whole of the technology. It's low cost, drives down emissions, um, near zero impact on local water supplies, um, low risk investment at the end of the day, because you've got power purchase agreements and, and guaranteed sources of income, and a very flexible and nimble supply chain which is able to meet the needs of the industry. Um, and local jobs and investment. Um, you just miss the jobs, not sure we would do the same thing. Um, certainly there's jobs during construction. Um, there are jobs that, that, that meet the needs of the supply chain. There are long-term operations and maintenance jobs. These are very good, high-quality paying jobs. Um, and they're put in regions that historically didn't have access to necessarily those very good quality high paying jobs. Wind turbine technicians uh, make very good money um, and they have the ability to move all around the country and, and work on multiple projects. 
So if we look at the prices, we're seeing that wind is, is, is 5% in Alberta of combined cycle, but it doesn't bring any fuel supply risk. It doesn't bring any commodity price risk. In Quebec, they sign contracts at 6.3 cents a kilowatt hour on average. They can't build hydro plants anymore for that cheap. They can't build nuclear plants that cheap. They can barely build gas plants that cheap. Um, and those are signed contracts in the books um, from the latest 450 megawatt PP uh, projects in Quebec. Um, very, very low. The Alberta Electric System Operator is forecasting 82 bucks, or sorry, $89, um, and that was from their 2014 uh, long-term outlook. Same as being found in the U.S., it's a little uh, tough to see. Um, there's wind down there. As far as Lazard is concerned, the only thing that's cheaper than wind is turning off a light bulb. <clears throat> Same study is, is showing, I think I glance that way. This was, this was last year's, they've, they've updated, Lazard 9.0 is now fine, is, is concluding about a 61% decrease in cost of wind over the past five years. And it keeps going down. The cost of conventional fuel, um, conventional thermal power plants keeps going up. <clears throat> On the greenhouse gas emission side, um, there's a groundbreaking study in the U.S. called the Western, uh, Western Wind and Solar Integration Study. Similar one was done for the East, um, Eastern, Western, Eastern Interconnect had its done. Um, CAMWE is about to unveil in about a month or two a pan-Canadian wind integration study, um, which is the first time we've ever modeled the entire interconnected power system in North America. Um, and uh, the results, frankly, are not actually as surprising as some people may think. Wind is driving down emissions, wind is reliably being integrated on the grid, and modern and current tools are able to help ensure continued reliable power system operation. But in terms of CO2, NOx and SOx, uh, wind is driving down emissions. Um, and this is, a, this is a study that looked at 16.5% wind and 16.5% solar. And so it compared that to a business as usual scenario. <clears throat> in terms of water use, um, again, wind is extremely low on the water use side. Um, and, and is an attribute of the, of the technology that can be brought to all sorts of regions, including, uh, including arid regions. When you load all that together, you end up with a low risk investment. Um, an investment that, that yields a high return um, because of the fact that these projects continue for, for decades and decades with, with power purchase agreements that recognize the attributes they bring to them. <clears throat> That's all I got. Happy to talk. Cheers. Okay, I'd like to just uh, thank again all of our, uh, for, thank Martin and our panelists for the, the interesting talks. And I think there are a few different uh, microphones around the room. Uh, and we're happy to take uh, any questions uh, people might have. Um, I think Nick has a question and a question up front. At the back, and then to Yeah. Is this, uh, this is on, okay. Uh, this is a question for Tom. I was, uh, had a question about, um, I guess your, your figure is on wind energy cost. Um, so I'm not a, an engineer, but the, the numbers that I see are increasingly um, skeptical of the levelized cost of energy as a metric for comparing different renewable energy or different energy technologies with one another. For just the reason that you brought up initially, which I guess I want you to unpack a little bit, which is that normally we think of wind as being not dispatchable. So it, you know, you get your energy when the wind blows, but you don't get it when the wind's not blowing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess the work I'm familiar with and thinking about now is the work of Leon Hurth, who's done a bunch of, probably something, something you're familiar with, who's done studies of the uh, effective cost of different energy technologies, especially as the penetration gets high. Mm -hmm. So as the penetration of wind or solar gets high, we start seeing more and more power delivered at the same period of the day, which pushes down the value of power at that period in the day. And so his, his figures suggest this levelized cost of energy isn't a very good metric and that the value of wind or solar declines significantly once penetration starts getting higher because we start getting a lot of the power delivered in the same period of the day. So I just, um, and he's also thinking about these, I think what the same kind of wind energy 3.0, he, he talks about bigger towers. Um, which, which you know, alleviates some of the variability in wind. But maybe you could tell me how wind can be load following and how it can work with the grid as opposed to against it, because that's, I know, one of the big questions that people have about wind energy. 
Well, I mean, it's load following from a, from a flexibility. So uh, all of the backdrop, of course, is that the fuel is there, the wind is there. Obviously, if there's no wind, then you're not, you're not going to be following the load. Um, is that the main concern? Uh, it is, but but the fact remains is that that on a deeply interconnected power system, you're not reliant on any given source. So a power system is designed. I mean, the, the fact that wind goes up and down isn't a surprise to people. We we knew that all along. Um, but everything else on the power system goes up and down as well. Um, and and so the, the, the nature of the, the discussion that says, well, wind is variable, therefore it needs to be backed up by a dedicated power plant, assumes that the system operator follows every single power plant at every point of the day, which they simply don't. They balance supply and demand. They balance supply and demand through a series of, of, of algorithms and information they get based on available capacity, uh, transmission capacity, um, available supply, load demands, and so on and so forth, all of it ends up in a balancing act. Um, so, so when wind dies down, it's replaced by something. And wind picks up, it's replaced by something. But it's not a dedicated one for one. Um, if we did, we'd see that evidence in terms of the build out of the power system, um, which we don't. And that's because that power system in and of itself, no matter where you are in the world, is designed for the ebb and flow of power supply. Um, I'm not familiar with the study you, you just mentioned, so I'm not going to comment on that. Um, I, think, I think when you look at what the prices are that are being signed in the market, that to me is the most indicative of what the cost of that energy is. Um, the, the prices that we're going to see in the LRP that are coming out, I would venture we're going to be in the 70s to 80s. Um, in Quebec, we're in the 60s. In fact, that was an average. One of the prices was 59 bucks. We're seeing in the US, some PPAs get signed for 20 bucks. It's very, very cheap. And investors are not going to sign a PPA that's going to see them lose their investment. So I think that the marketplace is the best place to look at what's the cheapest source of power. Um, and, I, and I'd say that those are, those are the variables that, that I think are the most indicative. I had just two questions. One is a micro question, very micro, and that concerns the, have you, when you looked at your research, have you asked the buyer and the seller whether they were affected by the, the these, these uh, visible signs of the windmill? We can understand, of course, someone who's living underneath the windmill with the shadow effect, surely they will be immediately affected. But once you get one, kilom one kilometer away, it really becomes extremely small. So are they actually affected by this fact that they can see a windmill one kilometer away or not? That's the micro question. The macro question is more complex, <coughs> and it deals with markets. <coughs> what you did was a study of market value of the property. But we are also very much aware that market values in any property is extraordinarily affected by the infrastructures and the surroundings of the property itself. And they change almost daily. I mean, if you look at the macro state of our economy and how things work, you see that there are all sorts of real issues regarding market valuations with respect to something like an airport or a, a superhighway, whatever it is. In other words, these are really factors that we deal with day to day. And I would like to know what you would think that the windmill, does that have really have much of an impact with respect to these much larger market questions of property valuation? Um, so to the micro question, no, we, I don't, uh, historically I have not done a lot of survey work, so we have not gone out and asked people, did this, did the presence of this uh, wind turbine uh, if impact your decision at all. Uh, I have done that. Stuart, I think, might be able to help with that question a little bit. Um, he, he has done survey work. I think um, the nice thing about having um, more and more data, which, is, you know, of course, is one limitation of this particular study, but is that um, you don't, in fact, need lots of people to have a specific dollar figure in their head about 
well, I'm going to pay less for this house because it has this disamenity or not because of the wisdom of crowds, right? You have enough people buying and selling houses um, that even if an individual is not thinking about it, they might be looking at comps and those comps are in the same area and they might, you know, sort of the, the wisdom of crowds is going to drive prices based on amenities, whether or not an individual goes, oh, those wind turbines, I have a partial view of those wind turbines and they're 1.2 kilometers away, so that's going to drop my bid by the, I mean, of course no one does that, um, but in aggregate that adds up. And so, I, and then to the macro question, I, I, if, I, if I understand it correctly, basically you're saying there's lots and lots of things that impact property values and so um, is it really true that wind turbines do? And, and I, you know, we control for as much of the idea of hedonic analysis um, is to control for as much as you can uh, in terms of other factors um, that, that impact property values. Control for location, uh, which we do uh, as best as we could in this, in this study, um, because location is like the number, you know, I think of, you know, uh, outside of bedrooms and bathrooms is the number one driver of property values. And um, so we want to control for that, and we use fixed effects in order to control for local impacts. Now, traditionally I've used, I've done uh, big, even bigger studies um, where I'm able to use a finer grain f fixed effect to control for local factors. Um, that was hard to do in this study given the sample. The other problem was that, um, as I understand it anyway, we didn't have comparable census, what well, in the United States we call census blocks or census block groups, which are smaller geographic areas defined by our Census Bureau. Um, and my understanding from Richard was that we didn't have a great um, correlate in Canada, which was one of the things we, one of the reasons we dropped that as well. So, but, but indeed, you know, the, I think um, I'm confident and the literature is confident that you can find impacts from little things Wind turbines aren't so little, but you, lots of different things impact property values. And if you do a proper study controlling for as much as possible, uh, you can identify the impacts of particular things that you might not think are all that important. I think we had a question back in the back corner here, and then we'll go to Stefan after that. I'd first like to thank Martin for an interesting and informative presentation. Um, when it's time for uh, a family photograph, I, I'm asked to t turn my back to the camera. And now I realize it's because my family thinks I'm a visual disamenity. <laughs> uh, it's not a term, uh, and I thank the social scientists for constantly bringing up terms I can use. Uh, my question's for Stuart, though, and it's a continuation of the question that was, the macro question that was just previously asked. We're, we're all too aw well aware of how industrial, commercial, and institutional activity in a region impacts directly on, on uh, uh, permanent resident property values when a plant shuts down, when uh, a, a commercial operation stops, we see that. Um, so it seems to me that borrowing, uh, as Stuart made the, uh, the comment, used the term, uh, uh, it was the, the, the term that we need policy remedies. My question, or I suppose it's more a comment in relation to Wolf Island, is that what really would help would have helped there was the implementation of industrial policy. That is to say that rather than our planting standalone wind farms in uh, uh, regions that we go to hybrid systems, whereby uh, wind farms are Wind, uh, wind turbines are uh, hybridized with gensets driven by fuels that can be biogenically derived from agricultural residues using commercially proven or commercialization ready technologies. I believe that that would have the effect of encouraging industrial activity in the agricultural sector, if it were the case of Wolf Island, which is an agricultural island. And I, I believe that uh, it would uh, deal with a lot of the issues that uh, policies are, are trying to address and which academic studies have addressed jobs would be created, there'd be less disparity uh, uh, in the rewards to residents 
because now there's a possibility to participate, not just through siting of wind turbines on a property, but also if you're a, a running a farm, being able to provide waste to the manufacturer of fuels. So um, I, I don't know if it calls for a comment, but I, I do believe that within the spectrum of industrial, of, of policy considerations, industrial policy is terribly important. Any comments? Sure. I, I think it, it, it also probably relates to, to some, the first question that was mentioned about dispatchability, too. I mean, if you have a, a hybrid system that in some way combines wind, the intermittent nature of wind energy production with something biogenic that can be dispatched as, as needed, then, then it, it deals a little bit with the variability question that, that, uh, that Nick was mentioning. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, so we, the, one of the points was made, or a little bit of debate about how many jobs there are created by wind energy, and I think in Wolf Island there's a, there are a dozen people that work on work in the project. Uh, so given, you know, given the the landscape scale and the impact, that's a fairly small employment uh, footprint. And what you're suggesting is that you have a, you know, if you're going to do energy in Wolf Island, you can you can do it in ways that are going to increase employment benefits and, and broader regard. So I think that's a, it works not only in employment but the dispatchability, the engineering aspects of it too. So it, it, it makes sense from from my point of view. Um, all right, if no other comments, uh, Stefan. <coughs> I have a few questions uh, for Martin and uh, Stuart might also uh, you know, have some answers there about Wolf Island especially. Um, I wonder uh, uh, what strikes me is uh, that there might be an endogeneity issue there um, when you place the wind turbines like in Wolf Island. Uh, you, you, uh, I mean the difference you have in your study is on your data set is that on Wolf Island people were compensated and, and outside of Wolf Island they weren't, so on the US side for example. So wouldn't you then in the negotiation place the wind uh, turbines strategically for those people that are compensated uh, uh, as opposed to those that are not compensated? So you know you don't care about the US side but you care about where you place the turbines on, on the island where people get compensation. So that's one point I just wanted to, uh, and then uh, the other thing is uh, I wondered how did you control for the property price trends across the border? You said that in the US uh, there was a, you know, there was a crisis and in Canada there wasn't. So I just wondered if the fixed effect captured that alone or not. Sure. And, and then finally one la last point is the $650,000 compensation it's quite a bit for like a thousand people or so. That, that will definitely reflect in the reduction of property taxes, especially if you want to build a hockey rink or something. So uh, did you factor that in as well? Okay, so, uh, so, let me, okay, so the last one, um, yeah, so actually I think uh, the more I think about that $650,000, I think you're right that it is a substantial amount of money. It's to the township of Frontenac Islands, which includes uh, both Wolf Island and, uh, and a yeah. couple, two other islands, Small I think. Island, yeah. So um, I don't know what the total population of that township is. Probably not much more. Those are smaller islands, so probably not much more than 1,200 people. You're probably right. That's a that's a good number. Um, the second question uh, was trends. So these analyses for um, Ontario, for, uh, the Canadian and American sides were run separately, uh, with the in, with separate trends for each side, so that we're uh, we don't have to worry about the fact that there's a different trend in the United States versus Canada. That's automatically controlled for by running the analysis completely separately. Uh, we originally had run it together, pool it, and then run interaction terms, but it was unnecessarily complicated. We also um, running them separately also saves us the trouble of dealing with the exchange rate. Um, which, while we can, you know, we had, uh, we got, you know, the trend of exchange over time, I think it's easier just to ignore that, especially um, this period was a period of appreciation, substantial appreciation for the Canadian dollar. Um, uh, we'd, I'd rather not deal with that. Uh, the last problem uh, was endogeneity. So I... So in general, endogeneity would be an issue. Um, I'm not too worried about it in terms of this project. For one thing, because I think that the wind project was driven, uh, it wasn't my sense, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense of the siting of this wind project is not that they looked at Cape Vincent, and they looked at Kingston, and they looked at Wolf Island, and they said, oh, uh, 
property values are low and we'll finally let's put the wind project there. I think what they saw was a big expanse of um, agricultural land with good winds, uh, wind, good wind characteristics. Um, so I don't think that they were, you know, so ordinarily when we think about endogeneity, we would be worried about wind turbines going in places with lower property values, um, all else equal, because it's cheaper to put wind turbines there. In this particular context, I'm not too worried about that. I view the Wolf Island selection more or less as an endogenous event in terms of our sample of properties. Um, I've worried about it a bit in the past uh, in my other study where um, if you're looking at a, in an area that's all amenable to wind, uh, you indeed would expect the wind turbines to go all else equal in places with lower property values because presumably you have to pay those homeowners less, right? Um, in this case, I don't think that's an issue that we have to worry too much about. Uh, 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 sure. The interesting. The uh, this idea of endogeneity and, and whether or not wind projects get cited in disproportionately areas with disproportionately low property value impacts. I think you know anecdotally at least that's quite true. In the at least in the, the late, latest round of the LRP and maybe Tom has uh, some ideas here. The large renewable procurement. It seems like the the communities that are lending their supports, their municipal municipal support to developers are those that are. You know, in generally lower income areas, um, so that's so, so that's I just yeah. So, so that's certainly true. I think that um, that doesn't present a problem for the econometric analysis, uh, as long as you've got local area. If I've got if you've got local controls for you know right. your lo local fixed effects, that's not going to be a, that's not going to be a problem, um, unless you have the only time it becomes a concern is not. Like you're suggesting, you know, poorer communities are going to be more accepting of wind turbines. I, I suspect that is true. Um, what they just, you know, poorer communities in general are accepting of all sorts of projects that might bring economic advantage, right? Um, but in terms of my analysis, that only matters is within a community. So let's say we've got municipal level fixed effects. So within a town, the particular wind turbines are going on lower value sites than others within the town. That's the only thing that would cause a problem for this analysis. Um, not the more macro effects of going in this um, region versus that region. So it doesn't matter, just to follow up on that, it doesn't matter that you say, okay, listen, those guys in the US, they, they don't negotiate with us, we don't care. Let's put the turbines so, you know, uh, that uh, their values might be affected somehow. Are we not oh, sure. I mean, it's, it's certainly possible that um, the developer in this case thought that, well, so we don't have to worry about whether the Americans get upset with us, so let's put it here. That's, that's entirely possible, but it doesn't impact my analysis. I mean, it, sure, if you basically you've got a bunch of people that can't complain <laughs> uh, then, and like, so let's say you're putting wind turbines and you've got one area where you've got 100% of your neighbors are going to complain and you've got another area where you can put them and only half the neighbors are going to complain you're going to put it where only half the neighbors complain so it might explain your results yeah, oh it absolutely might explain my results it's not a problem for the analysis sure all right. Um, so I appreciate that. I think we've got a small reception waiting, and I'm not sure how long it actually runs for. It might only run until 6. So I think we'll – it runs for an hour? <laughs> okay. Well, it gives us a little bit of time then for some more discussions over and drinks. I, I just want to close Martin with – wants to close? Yeah. yeah, I just want to close with one response to what Stuart said in his um, discussion about all energy sources impacting property values. And I think while we don't talk about that in the paper, that is 100 percent true. And so while I want to be very careful to say that while I find negative impacts on New York homeowners regarding wind, that's not to say that wind should or should not be built uh, or that the benefit cost analysis goes one way or the other. It's just to say that these impacts exist. Um, it's certainly true that all power infrastructure impacts property values. Um, I'm, one of the things I'm hoping to work on while I'm here it has to do with pipelines and rail lines and oil trains and how those impact property values. That's certainly, I, I would expect there to be an impact. Power lines are a huge issue, transmission lines, and it's probably one of the biggest hindrances to wind development, certainly in rural America, is building power lines. Uh, uh, the, the transmission lines, no one, um, 
it's even harder in my maybe it's even harder to cite transmission lines than it is to cite wind turbines or other en energy infrastructure and that's definitely something uh, that we should be worried about and so again just sort of my overall caveat just because property values go down in my study on from wind turbines that does not mean that we shouldn't be building wind turbines it just means it's an effect an impact that we need to be cognizant of and we need to be prepared to compensate the people who are being harmed in this way all right thank you very much